Disclaimer. Co-creator David Gill is a friend of mine. I've had some back and forth with him on a Facebook group we're both in. That said, I have no intention of letting that enter my assessment here, because I am many things, but Merciful is not one of them. On to the review. Hello there, ladies and gentlemen, my name is Mildra, and I will be your Gaming Monk for the evening. If there's one game I've taken flack for defending above all the others, it'd have to be D&D 4th Edition. I don't think it's a perfect game, I've made that clear in my last couple videos on the matter, but I've always argued that its ideas didn't deserve to be abandoned like they were. The silver lining here is the fact that other people have picked up the proverbial slack and taken those concepts in their own direction. Heroes Against Darkness, Strike, 13th Age, Unchained Heroes, and so on. That brings us to Dungeons & Delvers. What started out as a heavily modified version of 4th edition, now into a hybrid of old school style with new school ideas. How does it hold up? Let's find out. At 141 pages, the game is very no frills. It's more interested in getting all its points across and partially assumes some familiarity with RPGs, more specifically some form of D&D. Its art style is simple, with a lot of shading to emphasize a darker tone that fits its style of play. While the PDF is well bookmarked, I will have to adhere to one of my rules and dock points for a lack of an index. This is more of an on-principle case, since the book has enough brevity and straightforward nature that you probably won't need it, but the foot has to be put down. Last time we did one of these for a D&D-like game, the concept was that of a greatsword fighter. In keeping with that tradition, we'll be doing it again for an elven fighter named Adam. The first step is ability score creation, rolling 3d6 for each ability score. In this case, Adam's scores are Strength 18, Constitution 17, Dexterity 16, Intelligence 12, Wisdom 15, and Charisma 14. Next comes Race. As an elf, he has a plus one bonus to Dexterity and Intelligence, and we'll be going with the Evoker talent using the sidebar suggestion to give him the Magic Missile class feature. Finally, he's proficient in bows, spears, and arming swords. Next is class. As mentioned in the beginning, we'll be going with fighter, which at first level will grant a few benefits. First, he's proficient in three skills, in this case being acrobatics, athletics, and dungeoneering. He has a plus one bonus to fortitude, a plus one attack bonus to any weapon, and either a talent or a plus one damage bonus. We'll forgo the damage bonus and instead take the sweeping strike talent. Finally, equipment. The starting equipment and money is based on your class, so in this case we start with the following. A long sword, a short sword, a spear, a heavy repeating crossbow, scale armor, a dungeoneer's pack, and 50 silver. Character creation definitely has an old school amount of simplicity to it, even with the use of talents as equal parts feet and spell. In addition, I think it's a nice move for vitality and wounds instead of standard hit points but I could see the spread of talents being a bit restricted to some, especially the damage trade-off classes like the fighter. Still, there's enough room for flexibility and not a one-trick pony job. Being based on an edition of D&D, the core mechanic is largely unchained from the more familiar D20 games. Where it stands out is in the details. One aspect I feel highlighting here is how the game handles magical effects. We'll focus on the cleric and wizard here. First, instead of using spell slots and spell levels, since spells are integrated into the game's talent system, you have a pool of points to spend. For clerics, it's favor, and for wizards, it's mana. The difference between the two is an overall theme. Cleric favor is arguably safer, but I suppose conservative is the better term. This is due to the fact that you never spend more than one point at a given time. Other effects are constantly active. In a further demonstration of that safety, Favor only recovers through offering sacrifices or after praying again the next day. Wizards, on the other hand, are far more dramatic. They have a set of mana points, as mentioned before, and these recharge after short rests based on their level. Further, a wizard can still cast spells using vitality and then wounds, if they have no mana to spend. Furthermore, mana expenditure is not always set. More often than not, it's based on a die roll. This means it can be very easy to burn through mana if sufficiently unlucky. Things like this and the use of a respectable skill system work to avoid problems that D&D has had with classes stepping on each other's toes. The degree of control is appreciated from this monk. 
I would be remiss if I did not mention the Appendix D book. This could be considered equal parts expansion and update to the core book. It could be argued to be Dungeons and Delvers 1.5. Aside from raising the level cap to 10, it also adds several new races and classes, addresses issues from the core book, and a smattering of optional rules. In addition, there is an expanded bestiary for GMs to pour through, and it makes a nice companion to the monster creation system in the core book. To use another analogy, think of the core book as the basic version, and Appendix D is the advanced version. Kind of funny this is the second time in the last few months I've made that analogy. In the foreword, David Gill talks extensively about working with Dungeon World. While it's not outright there, I can see a tiny bit of its DNA here. Tiny being the operative word. Even with that, Dungeons and Delvers delivers a solid performance that feels like a modern take on the old boxes. The only issue I could feasibly see is that it might not have the degree of customization some would want in their games. Even with all that, I am comfortable giving this game a stamp of strongly recommended. But it is with a caveat. If you get this game, get the core book and Appendix D alongside it. The core book is good, but much like Adventure Conqueror King's system, the Appendix D book goes a long way towards demonstrating the game's true potential. The bonus question of the hour, given what I've covered in the past in this series, is how does it hold up compared to similar D&D alternatives? I'd say it nestles in as a more customizable Heroes Against Darkness, and I would recommend it for people who lean a bit old school, but not quite OSR levels of retro.